Hello there everyone and thank you for joining me here at the start of a new campaign in Tiano, the last of Europe, which we're playing as, well, the United Kingdom. Right now we're in the Civil War, it's August 3rd, 1964, um, and we're trying to get Gerard Wallop. However, I wanted to show you what we have with this focus tree once you're done um, trying to settle all the problems with the initial phase of the Civil War. Um, that being said, we have all the stuff here we need to do, and then we'll have Gerard but Butler? Gerard Butler. Gerard Wallop, leading our nation, but over the wire one last time. The harsh winter that has brought the pillars of our state to its knees has finally ended, and it dawns a new sun and arises. This is a sun of war, a sun of victory. We have drawn up our plans to drive the traitorous scum from the shores of Albion, and we will do so. Our men are ready from the hardened veterans of the British Free Corps to our valiant German allies. The final struggle for Albion is about to begin. For king and country, we will emerge victorious. And we'll talk about legacy here. Pitt, Wellington, Peel, Gladstone, Salisbury, and Lloyd George. Nell Kane often found himself staring at these paintings late at night. A drink by his side, a reporter at his desk, he often found himself staring deep into the eyes of these men. Were they disproving of him? Would they approve of him? The caretaker PM. Only thrust into this position by simple bad luck, it seemed that his premiership was doomed to be a footnote. The tale of successor to a poor, unfortunate Dom villain stolen too soon. His eyes found himself back to that darn report. Another round of statistics. Another approval of recommendations. Another advance. He could not decipher their tactics, nor could he find himself the stomach to look through the death list, but he knew victory was close. Himmler was failing and fast. Most of the cities had fallen, and the people subjugated, and their armies faltering. They were so, so close to victory, yet this was no Waterloo, this was no Rourke's Drift, no Grand British victory. There would be no ode to his valor, no poem speaking of his or anyone else's grunt struggle. This was not but a desperate fight for survival, truly British slaughter, and yet he was glad of the slaughter, and that he dared not confront that. He took a final sip of his glass, looking out at the portraits. History had judged these men for their actions. How would Pitt have been seen? If the situation in North America had turned it disastrous, how would Wellington have been seen if Waterloo had been a crushing defeat rather than a glorious victory? And how would Lloyd George be seen if Kane's government would have fought Himmler? Nothing more than a traitor he expected. History would judge him for all his actions, and history often is quite cruel. Um, which one do we want? What about the benefits first? Ooh. It has not taken. Norwich, huh? Well, we kind of still have it. So, held on to or retaken Leeds versus to Manchester. Oh, we get stability. Stability. But this is more stability. You lose 5,000 manpower and get liquid reserves by 0.2 billion. But you get 0.4 billion here. You get two production units. But production units are nice. But that growth, oh, we got to have it. The uh, Midlands come next. The trader's greatest heartland uh, uh, lies in the Midlands. With the South secured, it's vital to begin the long drive north to cut the traders off at the source. If you hold the Midlands, our tribes will only begin. Our industrial hearts of Britannia are held within our grasp, and we must take them. The resistance may be fierce, uh, but we are fighting for Britain's future and we will be alright. If we fail to end our t this task, our long winter will begin again. Ford man made the center of Britannia burn the traitors from our shores, but we're going to do Edinburgh endures now forever. At the very start of this infernal rebellion, it seems inevitable that all of the north would fall under the resistance's overwhelming force. City after city fell to the horde. Yet despite immense pressure, Edinburgh held out. Despite bombing runs, frontal attacks, and waves of deception, this old and mighty Scottish city held firm, keeping a position in Scotland secure. Now their persistence and valor will be rewarded for the time of their liberations now. Their persistence and bravery almost certainly save thousands of men, and they should be spoken of in song forever for their bravery. Also, we do have a cup of a light tea here to keep us in some warm uh, Norwich. What do you mean we lost Norwich? Norwich was never lost. Well, I guess technically it was lost initially. As held onto or retaken. Well, this is bugged. Uh, Kennedy assassinated, but that's pretty normal. I do want to get this one down here, that'd be kind of nice. Also, I did do uh, <laughs> war taxes, so the growth isn't very good, but got it, lost plus. Is it truly Edinburgh? The young officer, Ross Cameron, peeked his head outside the military tent. The smell of gunpowder and suit filled Ross's lungs, forcing out a cough of the soldier. I decided you were taking a break for a quick minute, Cam. Now you're just smelling gunpowder? Ross turned back to the game of cards the five men were playing. Ah, oh, I'm sorry, mate, I was just uh, taking a quick peek. His squad mate sighed across from him. Uh, you know, this game doesn't quite work quite right without the sixth person cam. Almost being called back to the game, the loud crash of an explosion outside stopped them. The commanding officer pushed everyone aside to peek his head out. Dear God, Walter, hand me my binoculars. The commander turned his grip around the binoculars and tried to zoom in on the major fire in the background. He couldn't quite tell what it was. All he saw was the cross and the fire in the background, and without further notice, declared it simply as that. All right, boys, I think that was just a mere fire on the part of the resistance. I think they were meaning to, uh, were meaning to our position, but instead they hit a church down the road. Ross was suspicious. Suspicious. As he was a native of Edinburgh and had been around this area of camp all night and there was no church. Once he acquired the binoculars, he zoomed in on the true fire through the fi thick, heavy smog that filled Edinburgh's air. Sir, there was no church. What the resistance just hit was the Nelson Monument. Those stupid wankers. Not only have they been destroying the legacy of our country, but they're destroying history. Have they completely lost it? 
The resistance really wanted to push it that far, huh? It was destroying cities truly worth it for the victory? Smoke fills the air. Going down the road, and you'll find the bodies of hundreds lying in the streets, and most likely anyone um, still left inside the cities, either burning or hiding, uh, uh, with tears running down their cheeks. As, of course, they spoke. They lost their minds a long time ago. As, sir. Yeah, to Leeds. The traitors have put up a bloody fight, but they have broken our superior arms. They have broken before our superior arms. Leeds is once more under our control. The victory of the North Sea coast is well within our grasp. Soon the US of Yorkshire will be within our grasp, and from Yorkshire, Liverpool awaits. Which I'm sure I'm saying it all wrong, but whatever. Hey, growth is better now. Love it. That's what we love. Almost where the heart is. In the midst of the frigid winds, a group of soldiers huddled around a makeshift fireplace, drawing their clothes without touching his flames. Wary from patrolling the Midlands rolling hills, they welcomed any warmth against the cold. They exchanged stores, and among them were Ben and Adolf. Ben was eager to share. Well, Ben vividly recounted his youth, the soldiers listened, and an aged man asked, Well, you lads from Birmingham? Ben nodded. No, new folks here. Nice place. Shame it was bomb when the Jerry's came, the man mused, chewing a biscuit. Hope's all well, that ends well there. Now for the same old Liverpool, though. A pause followed. My mom and two siblings lost during a raid. Jerry Rocket raised her home. Nothing left. The man's voice quivered, locked it, locked it in hand. Remember, before the sentence, pray. Family safety. Friends. Anyone else? Close. You think differently until you go back and find yourself without a home to stay and people to be with. Sounds embraced them. Ben dwelled on the man's aged words. Or aged man's words. Thinking of the Birmingham bakery's mother ran, brother Martin aiding. A children, fr childhood friend, Davis, wrote for the local paper, and his sweetheart Sylvia prepared for housewife duties. Devastation from the uprising chilled Ben. He dreaded more destruction in the coming weeks. With only eight off by his side, losing anyone more haunted him. So not ben, despite not being religious, the man's words compelled Ben to offer a prayer. Clapsing hands, he whispered, Lord, please keep everyone back home safe and sound. Amen. Uh, Oh, where's the Scotland? If I have to use Khan's commands, it'll be it, whatever. Ah, oh, blood, blood in the land of song. From the very beginning of the post-war period, the Welsh people have always been a rebellious lot, so unwilling to see the good that natu natural change brings. Since the day the war ended, they have been a thorn in our side, acting as a hub of terrorist activity, unfortunately. Um, the rocky hills and bustling cities have hidden the traitors from our loyal soldiers for 20 year long years, and the people have slowly been radicalized into supporting the most foul of ideologies. The kind of impertinence is a cancer. We must stamp it out before it infects the rest of the Union. We have been far too kind to of this rebellious attitude in the past, and we won't make that same mistake again, of course. Drop. Floyd Robinson's thoughts were muted up by constant clicking and rotating machines behind him. Several paper-thin threads stretched across the well, compressing further into the new patterns for the military. Sea line era camp flush patterns were switched out for new top-of-the-line material from the farms of mainland Europe. Floyd always kept a stolen wall thread in his jeans, just in case of an emergency. He always needed to be protected no matter what. Now, there is a stained blood of collaborators landing its grip. And a failure to protect himself would only lead to his own death, in which in these times would send him straight to the headlines. A large commotion was heard from the entrance to the factory, although most of it was unintelligible from Floyd's position. He kept us down at work, at his work, hoping to avoid any conflict. The power of the machine was sh shut off. His co-workers started dropping on the ground. They were not hurt. They were just simply dropped. Then he heard it. This is a subdivision of MI5 specializing in the Leeds area. Everyone on the ground now. I repeat, this is a subdivision of MI5 specializing in the Leeds area. Everyone on the ground now. So many bullets started dropping down his neck at the same speed he did. Underneath the work area, so you could see the German boots marching to each and every worker, berating each one of them with questions. Floyd's eyes widened. These men are meant to deal with the resistance. Where do they see the gun? Crap, 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 crap. He looked at the back to his palms. His fingertips had pruned. He took a uh, deep sigh. This was it, huh? He kills several collaborators and helps take several areas and just have them be shot here on the ground of his job, the one place he hated more than London. He slowly reached to the vaulter and affixed it to a sip. He had to be prepared. Wait, a dragon defiant has not held on to or retaken Cardiff. Wait, why do we do that one when we, get, when we have to do this one? Card of Surrender. The Welsh dragon roars in pain and defiance, and the spirit of St. George severs his head. After a long, bloody series of battles and rapid advances, we've had the distinct pleasure of reclaiming Cardiff from the resistance. Our troops now march into Wales' biggest city, ensure that the new orders maintain, securing the knowledge that this is only the first domino to fall on the Welsh front. We cannot afford to get careless yet, however. Well, this is indeed a significant victory for the forces of order and stability. It's imperative that we act quickly in seizing the rest of Wales from the resistance. Let's get bogged down in the uh, muddy Cumbrian countryside. It makes no sense why this is not available to us. We've retaken Cardiff. A humiliating start. Uh, uh, stalemate. Humiliating stalemate versus the North Pacified. Our campaign through Wales has come to a righteous end as the traitors rebels flee from the might of our events. While well, victory is indeed major, the battle for Britain is not yet over. We must capitalize on our success before the tide of war begins to turn in favor of the enemy, the Anglian Dagger. East Anglia. 
It is currently the largest single thorn in our side the traders hold. Despite all of our efforts, they've held it through this throughout this long winter, but it's time for the sun to melt their chaff and drive them from the foothold. If we to secure a hold over Britain, we'll need to take East Anglia and swiftly too. The time has come once more for the guns of war to roar with fire and fury. It is time to march on. Ten miles to Wales. Look alive, lads, called the sergeant. We're approaching Wales. Adolf looked behind him, peered up of the flap of the squad's truck. There were steep green hills around him, and trees and hedges under the shadows of the valleys. Mountains in the distance, white clouds drifting lazily over the blue sky. Adolf thought he had never seen a sky as beautiful in all of Britain. What would they want to spoil such a beautiful land, he asked to one. Or asked no one. They passed by a small hamlet. A shepherd watching the convoy pass with his herd milling around the field. He wore a stoic mask to hide his fear. Nobody could see it at this distance. Treason runs in the blood here, I think, the soldier in front of him. Colin, thought Adolf, leaning in with a conspiratorial glee. My cousin was a copper here. Uh, oh, said the sheep screwers were rowdy dudes. He put the rifle in his lap. Well, bring him in line, all right. I've been a card up before, said one of the soldiers. Nice place, friendly people. Blood sh bloody shame they chose the wrong side. Uh, Sorry, do you think we'll see some action? Asked Ben. Assume that you will, Private. You lie, keep your eyes open. This is a rubble country. They'll, start, they'll be looking around every tree. Colin leaned back into his seat. The truck shook on the uneven dirt road. Adolf and Ben became aware of the weapons. On they went to silence the song. We have all this stuff going on here too, but whatever. Oh, I'll do it anyways. It doesn't hurt us that much. Growth didn't hurt that much more. We've got like one and a half more billion, two billion. One should savor each day. He's still making stupid little eye do, do little doe eyes at you, you know. He'd be blown kissy faces if he wasn't just so shy. Maisie nearly snorted into her pie, pie in laughter. She didn't have to turn around to know that Ian and Dennis's stupid faces were grinning from ear to ear and that the next table over, the boy they were mocking was blushing furiously. She took a swig of lager, silently flipping Ian a rude gesture before settling down the pink glass. You're twat, Ian, you know that? All right, proper twat. What has he ever done to you, anyhow? She heard the sound of Ian scraping the bar stool across the ground loud enough that it struck out even the, in the crowded Norwich pub. Bringing it across, he plowed himself down on the stool and leaned across the table with his customary smug grin. Maisie rolled her eyes at him, at him only for him to shrug in response. It's not me, Maze, it's you. You learn enchanted him. Here, if you don't believe me, ask Dennis. Back me up here, Dennis, big man. He was looking for you, whispered Dennis conspiratorially. Come on, Maze, you told me you fancied him, and who knows how long we'll be in all of Norwich. Could be could be we move out soon and you'll never see him again. Not likely to trick Ian seriously suddenly serious. Say the chairs are grouping in the south. It's not over yet. Not to buy a bloody long shot. They'll be coming in for the city, don't you even doubt it? Come on, Maze, it's about ready to get real nasty. Take your darn shot, ask him. He's too scared to ask you. Maisie silently stared into her beard. Ian was a twat, but he had a point. Every time they'd push, the collaborators almost had willingly pushed back without breaking. It'd be months, and they were still stubbornly holding on. Well, what happened if they still hold on when the Germans got their mess together? It was something Maisie didn't want to think about. Maybe she'd ask now, just in case she never got another chance. She sat out, think about it. Drive them into the wash. We've done it, despite all of their efforts. Despite all the blood spilt and the traitors and revolutionaries have been driven into the sea and our flag flies, flies proudly over East Anglia. With his loss of traders are severely weakened and the plans of free our nation from the dastardly grip can continue on schedule. This is but the first of many victories to come. Liverpool within our sights. Once our cause seemed lost, our forces in chaos, momentum loss, and our grand capitals under threat of falling laid almost laid waste almost by the resistance forces. Yet we survived thanks to the efforts of our brave soldiers and diligent leaders, and other resistance is in the same situation we once were, in one of the greatest combats in military history. We've managed to encircle Liverpool, cutting out the resistances, makes your capital. Yet we cannot be cocky, we must prove, move to approach the situation with equal caution and speed. Once the resistance was in the same situation we currently are, we cannot let ourselves make the same mistakes they once did. String up every last communist. Oh, look at this. This lady of Liverpool was once a mighty old city, a beacon of imperial pride and economic prosperity, a city at the forefront of the Industrial Revolution, yet Liverpool, similar to so much of the nation, is infested, infected by a virus that once infested so much of Europe. It's sick, plagued by a great specter of socialism. Before the war, these forces acted civil, attempting to portray themselves as a somewhat legitimate political party under the veil of the Labour Party. With the collapse of the old government, this performance comes to an end as they reveal their true traitors' intentions. Once we show mercy to these groups, allowing them to live after our victory, we shall not show this mercy a second time. We shall string up every socialist, Trotsky, as an enemy, enemy we find in the city. Hopefully, with the rot removed, Liverpool can return to the city at what once was, a city of grand tradition, not degenerate ideas. Capture all we can. Since the very first day of the Empire, when we were first making our careful voyages over the, to, the new, the world, to the New World, Liverpool uh, has acted as an essential city, serving as a port for the riches of the Americas. Its grand docks gave way to the sailors who settled the New World, a captured precious Caribbean islands, and lead way to dominance over Asia. The city was built upon the Empire's development, fueled by the immense profit of the Atlantic Triangle and all other trades. It's a grand old city, and it's once ours once more. While its wealth was, has waned in recent years, it still acts as the hub of British trade and its docks are a vital asset for whoever holds them. Now they are back in our hands, we must use this old port to finally end this accursed war. So, we don't want this one. We want Unite with the Bravest Ever Men. 
And in all of British history, there stands a long line of men and women who, in their darkest hour, did their duty and defended our small isle. Every century, the brave men and women of Britain stand up to prove the bravery and the dedication to our old and glorious nation. This century, our isles face many conflicts, yet it is in the current one that perhaps our greatest heroes can be found. Many have shown immense bravery in this conflict, most recently showcasing the brave soldiers of Edinburgh who resisted constant attack from the resistance. Let's give these heroes a welcome and praise they deserve. Drying Soil Lieutenant Colonel Kenneth Hawkins and the men remaining in the battalion all stood within the underside of a German destroyer, retreating back to the port of Bristol. While saying just from the evacuation of the Isle, he held his head in shame. It was only natural for him to do so after such a humbling defeat. The pride and confidence in his men alone was enough to shatter his soul to see them succumbing to the Himmler. He had not tracked the ship while in the time while on the ship, so he was shocked to hear the slipway slam against the cold docks of the mainland. Once he had heard the slipway, another thought entered his mind that eventually overwhelmed him. What did the government think? After a few minutes of pacing alone, one of his soldiers called him up to the main deck. He sighed deeply, hoped for the best, so waiting for him was General Edmund Bacon, one of London's most politically connected officers. He formally greeted the general, and after a moment of quiet, the general expressed his sorrows. Sir, God bless you and your man for what you face in the aisle. You know, I probably could have done better myself, not to offend, however, with a better coordination between your position and ours. We could have maybe crushed them before they even crossed the sights of even a sniper, but that's just wishful thinking. General Bacon looked over to see Colonel Hawkins uh, gazing aimlessly at the surrounding port. He scratched the bottom of his chin and tried to help out the seemingly to pray press Hawkins. If you're thinking that London's wanting to exile you, you're mistaken, my friend. I wanted to talk to the Prime Minister not even ten minutes ago, and he told me that the resistance you and your men against the Himmler was spectacular by itself. As a general myself, I can tell you that with the amount of time spent on the Isle, they won't be reaping the rewards of the victory until they're all six feet under. The fruits of the victory were always faded. Free Britain sees their evacuation from man as a result of the Pyrrhic victory, and they're right to think so. Rumors are that they have already received the first degree weapons from abroad. This won't be enough to justify their losses on man, though. For no one knows what tomorrow may bring. As she looked around at the broken windows and flipped over tables of Norwich's King's Arms, Maisie wondered if they had all gone wrong. Not long ago, everything had been fine. The collaborators were running. They'd been winning in for the first time in forever. It seemed like they were ready to do it. How the, how the heck had they gone from celebrating with drinks to cowering behind tables surrounded on all sides? We have to go, hissed Ian. What did the Germans just bomb the place in? Quiet boy, the voice came from a suit stained older man, with an unkempt beard now staggering up the stairs from the chair, another uh, from the cellar. Another company's captain, Maisie remembered. She'd seen him smile on the first night their two comp companies had parted and drank their way through the abandoned pub. The captain went as he walked, placing emphasis on his right leg and letting out a grunt every other step. Ian stared at him, open mouth, but if we honestly quiet. The captain dragged himself to a bench with help from another fighter, elevating his head leg with a hiss of pain. You so much as take a step out those doors and into that street, it'll be a bullet that meets you. The Germans aren't here yet, but the traitors have us around it. So stay your nerves and let them come. It'll be a darn easier sight holding them from here than out there. He unlocked like he still wanted a bolt, but gave a shaky nod. Quickly, him and several other me others moved up to take up positions beneath the windows. She moved to join them, setting her rifle just on top of a barricade between Dennis and a man from another squad she knew by face, but not by name. Good luck, she whispered to Dennis. He said nothing, gave her a scared look, and clutched his gun tighter. War Council. The collaborative forces have positioned themselves here at East New Manchester tomorrow night, hunched over and taping a heavily marked map of Merriside, and here to the northeast near Wigan. He raised his head from the map to look at the two men occupying the long abandoned shop alongside him. How long do you think, imagine we have until reinforcements from the south join them? A week could be less, replied Fitzroy McLean, pressing a cigarette into a well used ashtray. Knight looked to Jones, but the Union man only gave a grim nod of assent. No more, he says. Or else can't hold them in the open. They've got oil now and bloody lots of panzers. The fascist guys are marching freely. We have to fight them in the sea instead. I see that might not hold, insisted McLean. Leaning forward for emphasis, our anti tank is drying up and the Americans are getting unreliable. They can't take the city with what they have not yet, but when the southern divisions ride, Liverpool could fall. They will prepare for it if it does, uh, Knight hummed, tricking his chin, start moving the guns from caches back to the docks. McLean is correct, if Liverpool does fall, we can ill afford to lose our best supplies with it, Jones folded in his arms. And the lads inside of that happens, we haven't anywhere near enough boats for them all. If we try and send them all, they'll know what we're about. We, they can't go east, fascists are there. They can't go south, that's death. West the sea. Time it comes to siege, they'll cut off the north if they're not stupid. How do we get them out? None of the three men said anything after that, the only sound in the shop being the whistling of the wind outside. We can't sit McLean breaking the silence, not all of them at least. My boys can rest the supply lines to make Liverpool hell, but even if we abandon the city now or accept no retreat, we have to choose. The two men looked at the aged spy master now, holding up the map with a determined nod. Liverpool must stand. Which is weird, because I used consequences to drive them into the wash. It's just... No, what we're supposed to do? But whatever, the beginning of the end. Unicorn Owen, do you copy over? Silence persists on all frequencies. The radio operator, filled with anguish, twisted the knob one last time. Owen hasn't responded over 24 hours. They've likely been compromised. The bustling underground cell came to an abrupt standstill. Chaos ensued, with motions running wild, anger, confusion, despair reverberated off the brick walls. Emma's brow glistened with sweat as she sat motionless. Losing contact with Swansea, the last Welsh resistance stronghold, meant their forces were weakened. The haunting question loomed was this the turning point? With the submachine gun resting on her shoulder, Elizabeth strode forward boldly. Is it all over just like that? Her words drew the scattered onlookers closer. Do we give up because they might have fallen? 
Many shook their heads. Remember what we're fighting for, our family, our homes, and our freedom. Elizabeth's eyes locked with Emma's, conveying an unspoken determination to stay together no matter what. As she finished, Elizabeth's presence seemed to calm the crowd. Suddenly, a runner burst through the door, panting and bearing grim news. They're coming, he gasped. The government's army is moving north. At this pace, it could be in Edinburgh in a few weeks. A moment of silence hung in the air, seemingly endless. Then someone screamed, panic, shouting, and scrambling engulfed the cells of reality the impending threat settled in. The scene could only be described as pure pandemonium. Glendie's favorite son, suppressing the fl fire flood in the hallway, holding the SOE men in position. Collaborators blocked both ways out. The building around them had, been, had their door sealed. Surrounded by overturned shopping carts, bins, wood pallets, and the fallen brothers, the remaining defenders of Wales knew they would die here. They would die nowhere important, accomplish nothing. Yeah, why would we want to choose this one, though? No son of England will make it. I don't understand. Is, it, is this, this doesn't make any sense. But whatever. At the start of the last stand was Julius K. O. Evans. Oh, wow. An early leader of Welsh resistance. He was stuck behind the air carcass of the trunk. Firing under the frame with a machine gun. Burst rounds bounced a fracture out of the concrete. He held his barrel too low, but appeared down to correct his aim. Might have earned him a collaborator's bullet. The scrums did not correct him. They were all firing blind, all unit cohesion gun. Every man out for his own impossible survival. One of the SOE tossed a grenade. That was a lucky throw. Igniting just as the machine gunner to the north was receiving a new belt of ammo. One explosion set off a hundred more. The enemy screamed, panicked, and broke from the position. Kyle Evans leaned, leaned around the corner. Men's now our chance. Move, he rounded the corner and sprinted through the flames over to the corpses and across the road. One of these corpses, bisected by the explosion yet animated by spite, held his pistol up and pulled the trigger. Kyle Evans came crashing down, spat blood all over the streets. Still tried to drag himself across the road towards freedom. No collaborator recorded his final words before they shot him before, they could, before he could speak. I but blunt the horns, the horns of the offspring of Wales, lest they be, lest they should injure their dam. And of course, we just read about capture all we can. So this would be returning to epic country, huh? Is this the page that we're supposed to have, or is this the page for like the for Himmler? Because I want to do all this stuff here. Because we get better admin efficiency, poverty rate, growth, cinders. Thick black smoke was almost suffocating. Foul stench of bodies and ash choking Charlie's, he desperately ran through the ruined Liverpool streets behind him. The city burned. The crackling of flames and groans of collapsed buildings being punctuated by the screams, moans, and pleas of the dead and dying. He wanted to stop, do something, but to stop for so much as a second was death. He couldn't stop now with Jordan Butcher so close by. Suddenly, he heard the sound of voices and lunged into an alley before pressing himself against a wall. Please, God, please, please not let them not see me. Little Duke can surely run, laughed a voice from outside the alley. Let him, said another. There's no way out of the city for a little piggy. Come on, the rest of the boys are waiting. Charlie waited in the alley for what felt like an eternity, while well, the footsteps slowly faded away. While he was sure the two men had left, he broke back into a sprint towards the docks. Fred would still be there with the boat, he had promised. It was nearly nightfall when he made it to the water. He staggered towards Fred's boat with his arms raised in the air. Don't shoot, it's me, it's me. A familiar head poked its way up from the boat, blinking in surprise. Charlie, said Fred. Bloody heck, mate, thought you did. I thought they did you in. Get in, then, and keep your darn head low. Well, I need to leave soon, so where's the rest of the lot? But uh, Elsie brought you all together to meet. Charlie said nothing and shivering. He thought back to the meeting and how brave Elsie had looked, promising them that, that they would make it out. Jones had a plan, she said, and there were camps outside the city that could hide. He felt so brave, too, listening to her until he heard the rattle of machine gun fire and their brave words had turned to screams, until he had to cower among the corpses, praying the free corps would leave and be. Uh, the rest of the trade union men in the boat were looking at him, then they, all he did was turn away from them and press his face into the side of the boat, refusing to let them look at him to see the shame written on his face. The boat set off into the black water, leaving the crumbling city far behind. Onwards to Scotland. Scotland was once the last to join a union. While the English and Welsh had been united centuries before, the true political unity only came relatively recently in the Union Act. Only when we were united did we truly reach our full potential, only then did, only together were we able to conquer Grand Islands facing the armies of Europe, Asia, and, America, and the Americas together. Now they are once again occupied by the foreign puppets. We must do our duty once more to free our brothers in arms. We are one union, together forever. We cannot live as one... Part of ourselves remains under the rubble tyrant's boot, and if they do not return under peaceful means, then let the spirit of Edward Longshanks live through us once more. To the victor of the spoils. Hey, you're looking better already. Nice. Uh, the docks of Liverpool had weathered the fire better than the rest of the city, distant as they've been uh, from the worst of the fighting. Still, even from here, Colonel Ol Oliver Crowley could smell the smoke mixing with the sea air of the docks. Using an old shipping crate as an improvised tool, he sat down, lit a cigarette, and looked out into the Atlantic. Nowhere to run for the traitors now, they pushed him all the way to the sea and beyond. Colonel, sir, are you going to go on to see this? He looked up, being, being met by the sight of several of his men huddled around a small skiff covered by tarp. The soldier he call him, called him flashed him a quick salute. He waved hand, dismissing the man. At ease, Corporal, show me what we've got. The Corporal nodded, drawing a little uh, knife and sawing at the rope, binding the tarp to the skiff, uh, pulling it aside, and doing so exposed a number of open crates filled with M14 rifles and M20 bazookas. Crowley whistled smugly, picking up an M14 and examining him. Surprisingly good condition for something that, how far, that, that come so far. The Americans definitely hadn't prepared, spared any expenses. He pulled out a cloth, wiped the rifle down, and set it back in the crate. How many more caches like this? 
The lads found four more throughout the Prince Alfred Dock, sir, as well as one at Alexandra. We haven't checked Gladstone yet. Lads at Alexandra say that they won't even at AAA launches, but uh, have been do been, haven't been there to check. Crowley grinned uh, toothy grin. Get these onto a truck, Corporal. A little present for our boys from America. Those weapons were in top condition, not that it did any good to the men they were meant for. The way Crowley saw it, him and his men could use them to put them to better use. Both alike in dignity. Emma and Elizabeth split from the rest of their cell, retreating to a rooftop a block away with a terrace facing the su setting sun. They had to. Headquarters was full of radios and reports on the fascist Northwest advance, foreseeing their demise. There you are, said Adolf, who sat down next to a smiling Ben. Normally, the pair ate with the rest of the squad at the mess hall, but Ben was absent. Adolf did not expect much, uh, expend much effort tracking him down. He found him on the western incline of a hill, sheltered from the enemy, sat down next to Ben with his own rations. We don't have to stay here, said Elizabeth, who pushed through her own doubt and veiled disgust on Emma's face. We can go to Canada. We can be on the first ship out once they start the evacuations. It'll be safer there. It'll be kinder there. It'll... The rest of her words were cut off by a choked sob. It'll be all over soon, said Ben, finishing his can of curry chicken. Sarge said we've got a few months of this left, then we'll be discharged. We can go back to our lives. Adolf thought of his own home. Stuttgart, the townhouse, his father, mother, and brother, but part of him did not want entirely want to leave. It's not fair, muttered Emma, buried in Emma's... Elizabeth's uh, embrace to escape their doom. It's not fair. They can't win. She sobbed into Elizabeth, who, with brushes of the hair and firm hands holding her close, tried to comfort her lover. But there was nothing that she could say, no warmth she could share that would keep the incoming night away. Adolf made a joke and Ben laughed. Neither fully registered what they said, only that they hurt each other. They stared at each other for a moment, then they put it aside and resumed eating, watching the sun set over the highlands. Britain shall be united no matter the cost. Yeah. So I read this one earlier, and we'll read about Triumph in just a moment, and then chase him to the world's end. At last, the wars reaches the inevitable conclusion. The last scattered rebels are on the run, hoping that the North Sea or the Scottish Highlands will be able to hide them from their inevitable fates. Yet, this is but a lie they tell themselves. There's no salvation lying for them up north, no hope for a surprise victory against us, no hope of American intervention. There only lies defeat. There's no point in drawing out this conflict. Let us and move quickly. And sure, no other traitor voids. The King's Justice. The relief of the Siege of Edinburgh had indeed brought much of rejoicing, that much was uh, truly genuine. But the people, most of them at least, were not cheering for the victory of the government and their German overlords, but the simple fact that brutal fighting was at last over and they had survived. The military parade that followed uh, put things very much into perspective. The military parade, uh, as the collaborative formations marched throughout the streets to the sounds of the British grenadiers, they were met with genuine applause and a few cheers, if a little halting and almost regretful at times. Then came the black shirts, flashed and circled banners held high, along with a few units of the Free Corps, to whom sparse applause was granted by some, but mostly simply looked on in growing realization of what was happening. The clear, precise stamp of polished jackboots upon smooth cobblestone heralded the arrival of the true victors of the siege. Swastikas emblazoned upon their helmets and flags, as well as on the sea of panthers which rumbled behind the Kolnegratzer Kon Marsh. Beyond the silent streets of Edinburgh as the conquerors claimed the reward of total domination. When the sun set at last, Edinburgh wept, under the jackboot once more, and a final victory over terror. We have triumphed. At the start of this conflict, the wall left us for dead. They believe our cause lost, a government inevitable to fall. They stood like vultures over us, eager to carve up Britain to fit their wants. Yet, as so many frequently do, they underestimated Britannia. They underestimated the British spirit to win against all odds. They underestimated the strength, courage, and willpower of Britain. Most of all, they underestimated the British people. These liberal puppets thought the British people would just allow themselves to be resubjected. Yet, we stand strong and they lie defeated. Now, Britain must rebuild. It'll take many years for us to fully recover. Yet, with the end of this conflict, there lies a real opportunity for change. What form that change will take is up to the British People's Party. Nice. And it's 1964. I'll grab that, and I don't care about having time stuff. We're just going to grab this and grab it too. Hey, not bad, not bad. Inflation's not too high either. It's not to love. A lion's death throws, huh? Across Albion's hills and meadows, its rivers and fields, battle continues to rage. SOE tar cells target key leaders with lethal effectiveness, while fearless LR saboteurs attack persists from London to Edinburgh. Yet these attacks, once carried out with such fervor and certainty, do win both number and effect by the day. Uh, with the collapse of most forever front lines and morale, mass desertions have become a simpler fact of life among Himmler rule, or Himmler cells, really. Government soldiers, for the part, whoop and cheer, eager to extract retribution on those who they fought so bitterly. For the army and garrison, the battle's already over a matter of not when. A matter of, of when, not if. Some try to fight on all the same. With a long, within a, a long forgotten church in the Scottish Moors, a grizzled veteran of the Spain and Sea Line addresses his men. He speaks of past battles fought and friends lost. He vows that even one battle lost against the fascists, there will ever be more. His men nod, the gloom infesting the church, lifting somewhat. Even until the next day, the units four and less, and after that, two lost again. 
In a small village near Bath, an encircled company holds out for days, cut off from food, home, or hope. These men simply hold, unsure of where to go. One night, a hidden stash of sweets from York is found under the floorboards of a shop, and the men trade stories and foods, speaking of all the places they might like to see, from Brasilia to Toronto. None of the men ever leave the village. In dingy basement in Oxford, a man and a woman check their equipment. Two pistols and a handful of grenades. A man fights for king and country, the woman for a worker's brim. The two have little in common, less to speak about still, but both know where a certain German, German commander will pass tomorrow. His death will change nothing, for nor will a free Britain. The names will never be known, and the dreams never be realized. But the Germans will learn that even a dying lion has claws. But for how long? Oh wow, we actually finished the land doctor here. Fascinating. As we're just toying with them. We're just looking at them menacingly as they can't recover anymore. Ah, oh, they have a fiscal crisis. Good. Oh, they're actually attacking us. They have, yeah, look at that. Weekly stability is going down. They have 90% stability. Unit supply lines open. Militia force. Uh, as soon as this one's done, we're going to uh, attack immediately. Station closed. Uh, people of Great Britain, I, Maxwell Knight, leader of Her Majesty's Most Loyal Resistance. Darn it, Knight, darn it all. Say it. I hereby order all the forces in the British Isles to uh, loyal to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II to stand down. It was inescapable. The resistance had lost ground everywhere, lost so many fighters. Lands of supply, communication, support. The fascists severed them all. Jones and McLean had stopped responding. Knight feared the worst. All he could do was broadcast one last message to stop more unnecessary blood from being shred and shed. To the British people, I ask that you carry our bravery in your hearts. To this illegitimate government under the so-called British People's Party, I offer one last warning. A reckoning will not be postponed indefinitely. There the baton touched. A code of message meant for someone specific. He would hear this and take note. It was all up to him now. Hopefully he could do better than Knight did next time. If not, Knight hoped he could at least do more damage. And thank you to all those who fought for freedom for Queen and Country. I thank you. Though we have lost today, our fight shall continue. To the fallen, your sacrifices earn our highest respect and admiration. To the living, I wish you the best of luck in the years to come. God save England. God save the Queen. An old Webley, a Weebly lay by his side. Knight picked it up, opened the cylinder, loaded with plenty of bullets in the ammo box. Here are the fascists outside drawing closer. If they were going to drag him to hell, perhaps he ought to take a few of them with him, give, him, give the devil a little trouble or tribute. Knight sighed, unloaded the revolver, and pushed it away. No, there was indignity in the last stand. Knight had a different idea in mind. He rose, facing the door, ready to meet his captors. He would not be their victim, but England's martyr. So let's finish off this war, shall we? And happy November. Then once we have Aberdeen, we'll be done. 3.8% growth, 14 billion plus yearly. Ah, what a beautiful thing. As now, well, we might as well read here, English values. What happened to the dear old England? This land of nobility, virtue, and pride has fallen into petty infighting and ruin at the hands of our own sworn enemies. Have we put down a vile rebellion only to tear ourselves apart at the hands of a weak world liberal and would-be tyrant? No, we have not. Jared Wallop, 9th Earl of Portsmouth, has heard England's cries for aid and rides gallantly to her defense. The old guard of the PPP sally forth alongside him. True to the knightly figure whose image our party bears, we have held power for nearly 20 years and we will not lose it now. English character. It's a sad fact that politics and an awful lot of convincing is required to make politicians realize why you are correct and why they are wrong. It's precisely this laborious but vital task Lord Portsmouth must undertake if he is to secure his candidacy for Downing Street. The old guard stands behind him, but swaying counter crossbenchers and the Lords, wavering ideologues and pragmatists in the Commons is crucial to our success. As Walt cannot actually speak in the Commons, nor would it be fitting for him to do so, we must rely on loyal MPs to speak his words. Soon both chambers will resonate with his righteous words, and Parliament will come to support our noble cause. Challenger approaching. Uh, our nation suffered devastation unlike any in recent memory. It is in my view that one that I believe that shall be reaffirmed along the, among the lords and ladies of our most esteemed house that salvation lies not with the inexperienced ideologue or bloodless bureaucrats, but in the traditions once upheld by Sir uh, Admiral Sir Barry Donville. Get me, Fountain stammered to his secretary. Get me. His voice was abuzz with sudden news. Ringing phones were con constant, as with the barked orders of panic advisors. Bean, get me Bean, and Ham, get me. Bloody heck, get me everyone. I want them all in a room five minutes ago. For the renewal of our moral and spiritual health, for the rebuilding of our country so recently scarred by war, for the revitalization of the English spirit, I hereby announce that I will stand for the office of the Prime Minister. Butler rubbed his temples, where a headache pounded like an unwanted guess. He wasn't sure whether to thank or curse God for this. Yes, the BPP were split, but this new development activated party grandees. They might have otherwise slept through this conflict with Fountain. A field expanded, new players joined the game, and none of them were on Butler's side. To return dignity and honor to all Englishmen, in the season among the Green Dales. Under my stewardship, the British People's Party will continue work, continue the work of our predecessors in restoring glory to our isles. 
Walla bade farewell to the braying of journalists with a nod and walked away from the podium flanked by his advisors. He felt invigorated for the first time in years. He felt the Lord's hands on the till, and they were rested away from the wild, uncharted paths of zealots and technocrats. Only the old guard can steer her into the calm waters. Every action is an equal and opposite reaction in English wisdom. The ideologues are ours, the most members of reincorporated into the proper place under the old guard, and the stubborn few who remain reducted, reduced to irrelevancy. It's time to begin our offensive on our real rivals within Parliament, the pragmatists. While it's expected, a few have broken ranks to support us, meaning it's time to change tactics. Instead of combating and assimilating them within Parliament as we did the ideologues, we shall uproot their support base and leave them adrift. The common folk crave sound leadership, happy lives, and the end of all German meddling. Lord Portsmouth can provide all three, and it's time for the people to show this glorious truth. And they'll go into home for heroes, because not, we've not read that one yet. United Front, I'm aware that some of you may harbor reservations about working with us again, began Lord Sportsmith. So bringing the group of several dozen MPs gathering before him in a parliamentary lounge, not being used for anything but relaxing. However, he continued, Fountain simply cannot win against Butler. He does not have the support necessary to save Burton from the schemes. I, however, do. Go all a pause and engaging the reaction from the audience, all Fountain loyalists whom he judged could be convinced. From the remaining look of interest on in their faces, they could still be swayed. Many of you do, no doubt, lost faith in Chesterton after the uprising of 56, but I ask of you to consider, after your own recent experiences with an, an even more dangerous uprising, could he have done anything more than he did? I, I think, ask you to think very carefully about the future of this country, uh, set aside our own differences, and unite against a common foe and butler. Support me, we shall say this nation, concluded one Lord Portsmouth, waiting for a reaction, silently begging for one. One of the MPs stood up before him, a Peter Huxley Blythe, if you recall correctly, a staunch Mosleyite, and a leading member of the Hamlin's little clique. I cannot speak for everyone here, Lord Portsmouth, he began, glancing to the side at a pair of MPs seated away from the others, but you have my support for PM. If Chesterton stands with you, we will follow him again. Relief flooded over Wallops, he thanked Huxley Blythe, and made a mental note to reward him with a ministerial post for this, as the MPs filed out. A group of peers filed in, both looking equally surprised to see their counterparts here. A powerful force was building in Parliament's halls, and it was a force that Lord Portsmouth would command. As this is a new power's victory at hand, home for heroes, though. At the end of the day, who won us as war? The soldiers, that's who. These brave sons of Britannia who put their lives on the line and fought to save their nation from anarchy and madness. They are heroes, one and all, and deserve a hero's rest. Some have suggested that we redeploy forces across Britain to rebuild to keep our army mobilized for swift reconstruction. What utter nonsense. Not only would such a proposal be a gross betrayal of those valiant souls who deserve to return to their loved ones, but also horribly inefficient and detrimental to our shattered economy. We should send our boys home and begin drafting up contracts for rebuilding our mega corporate allies from across the channel. That's how we honor our heroes, and ensure their home to rebuild as quickly, cleanly, and efficiently as possible. It really is the least we can do, and shan't be the last. As well, the wisest of them all. Father had always wondered how exactly Wallop intended to sway the PPP to his side, given that he was stuck within the Lords. The new leader would be decided in the Commons that there was of little doubt, with Parliament being used as the primary battleground for the BPP's war warring factions. But just how would Wallop get around the restrictions on him speaking there? Today, Butler had his answer as the backbencher rose to speak. Proxies. Looking up at Wallop and his hosts of lords, Bedford and Chesterton among them, sitting in the gallery above, he could almost see that the strings descending down onto the MP about to speak. My right honorable friends, he began, as more and more eyes turned upwards to those who was really speaking. Britain remains in a crisis, and we require true leadership to lead us into uncertain, ti uncertain time and years ahead. Leadership, unfortunately, neither Andrew Fontaine nor Rob Butler seemed to possess. Shouting erupted from certain corners of the chamber, causing the speaker to bang his gavel loudly. But beside Butler, Fountain grimaced, both men momentarily united against the arrow sitting high above them. Fountain has proven himself a little more than a petulant child, claiming to be able to run the country, yet unable to even run the Black Church properly. Then there's Mr. Butler, the well-meaning, I'm sure, but far too influenced by international finance of bankers. He would see us sleepwalk back into the chains we escaped in 1945. Nobody listened as the speech came to a close. All eyes were now on Wallop, smugly observing the sea of faces from his perch in the gallery. The message was clear. Only Wallop had the experience, conviction, and strength to leave Britain, and he fully intended to do so. A cry of approval filled the chamber, and Wallop smiled, a speech for patriots. Britain now stands at a crossroads. Tens of thousands of our own now rust under our soil. Their fathers and brothers left to pick up the pieces and rebel, while this reality is obviously far from optimal. We have an opportunity to create a world forged in the vision of Britain's true birthright. One of our children can follow for generations to come. Our soldiers, great words they are, will be the guiding pillar in our new society. Those who fight to protect the British way of life will be immortalized in their triumphs. The first step in our vision for the future, of course. Virtue. Brigadier Tommy Edwards jumped off the tailgate of the military truck. He waved goodbye to his former comrades as they drove off into the distance. Edwards sighed. The whole war from him had been seen from many of his closest friends being filled with lead, with him being the last one standing. He guessed now that the war was over. It was a return to normalcy. He could enjoy having friends again, but even the Brigadier knew that that was a very dubious comment to make. Seeing the destruction that had rocked this few towns, the head of the squad already passed. 
Edward scratched a temple and looked behind him to see his family's home. He placed both hands on his head in shock, wood planks covered each door and window, dirt and small spots of blood were stained in, into the exterior walls, small holes littered the roof. He threw his bag against what was left of the fence and ran into the home. He beckoned for his father, nothing came back. He called out for uh, his mother, and this time was a success. Leading his head into the living room entrance, he saw his mother secluded to her chairs, reaching her hands out to her son. Edwards felt straight into her arms. After a decent two minutes of bonding, the son asked his mother a question he never wanted to ask. Mom, do you know where dad is? Releasing Tommy from her arms, he pointed to the photo on the table next to her. Tommy, I would never imagine this day would come, but your dad, my George, he didn't make it. His eyes widened beyond belief, he let the tears flow down his face. Before he could grieve, he made a promise that the house may have been lost, but the memories would remain. If you want to read about any martial law, please go right ahead, because I can't wait to see what the path holds for our Gerard Wallop. Ending martial law. Oh, is this nothing here? Oh, yeah, military professional continues to improve as well. Look at that. Nice. It's, yeah, it's getting worse here, but whatever. Admin efficiency is improving. We barely have any increasing poverty. It's a little bit, but not very much, which is good. Andrew Fontaine here, of course. We've got Gerard Wallop, but we have overcome. If you'd like to do about that, please go ahead. The end of an era, really. The King's Hand. It was strange how one could know a man, but not really know him at, at all. In theory, Edward should know the Earl of Portsmouth, especially with how often they met. He had been subjected to a solid ten minutes of the Lord's agricultural opinions, and Wallop had no shortage of opinions at a Balmoral party once. Even so, at the time, he had only taken moderate notice. Considering him just another eccentric Lord vying for attention, no sooner had he finished that thought than the door swung open and a servant entered, followed by the Prime Minister. Wallop bowed. Your Majesty, pronounced Gerard Wallop, Wallop dramatically. Rising from his perfect bow, he gestured to the crotch across from Edward. May I? May I? Edward uh, nodded. Please, my congratulations on acquiring the BPP's confidence and on your ascension to Prime Minister. It's a relief to have someone I, can, I know I can rely on in the office. The last part of it was a bit of an exaggeration, but Edward figured he ought to start off on a good foot now that he finally had a Prime Minister who seemed to respect him. You were done me, Your Majesty, if I may say so. Your confidence means even more than the party does. We're all servants of the Crown, after all. Wall's face took on a serious expression, and you have my word, Your Majesty, that so long as I remain Prime Minister, I shall never allow the Crown's authority to be challenged again. Well, this little uprising will be the last of its kind. Maybe this could be a good thing, after all. Uh, the king considered. After Lloyd George's coughing, Bedford's astronics, Chesterton's dismissiveness, and Donville's disinterest, having a prime minister who actively actually listened to him would be a welcome change. Cautiously, cautiously optimistic, the king favored the earl with another nod. In that case, Lord Portsmouth, I would be pleased to invite you to form a government in my name. His Majesty, the king has asked me to form a government, and I've accepted. In the footsteps of my forerunners, I once again tread, and England's hills uh, once again be bright. Lord Portsmouth appointed Prime Minister. Gerard Wallop, ninth Earl of Portsmouth, has been appointed Prime Minister of the United Kingdom following the resignation of the predecessor, Ronald Nell Kane, second Baron Brocken. A longtime friend and ally, former B PM Barry Domville, before his assassination, Wallop's appointment represents a surprising resurgence of the declining conservative wing of the BPP. Although there are rumors bound that indicate that Lord Portsmouth may have his own designs for Britain. In his first speech, Wallop announced that he would lead a government true to His Majesty's King. To, true to his majesty, the king, and that would heal, he would heal the wounded spirit of the realm. How exactly the new prime minister tends to accomplish this is unclear, though through sweeping reforms across all sectors of society are expected, along with the bullish stance against the German medical corporations in Britain. A triumph of the old guard or something even older? The uh, government true to his majesty. For the second time in, since 1956, puppets emboldened by the shadowy masters in America have sought to drown a fair isle in bulls, bolts, bombs, and flames. Yet despite their vilest efforts, we true men of character and vision stand triumphant once more. Britannia's loyal sons remain vigilant in our defense. We're ready to continue the same noble agenda we've pursued for so many years. To the end, Gerard Wallop, Ninth Earl Portsmouth, and Britannia's most loyal son shall assume his mantle as our leader with his majesty's blessing. Guided by a strong hand and bolstered by our indomitable faith, Britain shall retake her glorious place of pride in the pact, and as a beacon for all, the world to marvel at. Thus under traitors. It seems that all the fascists are created equally. Fountain and his unorganized squad of louts and hooligans are a disgrace to the British People's Party and all it stands for. Their mere existence is a shameful reminder of our failures in the 50s, and even now they continue to drag us down to their base level. We cannot, will not allow them to spread their infection to government policy any longer. It's time for these wayward souls to be punished for their impunity. Also, answering to Fountain will be cons consigned to the back benches and perpetuum until they see the error of their ways and return to our fold. Well, thank you again to move our country on from the failures of the past decades into an, and into a glorious future. Sweet Auburn, love this village of the plains, dear Lord Portsmouth. I would first like to thank you for your efforts in maintaining order during a second national crisis. Without your timely intervention, I shudder to think about what further damage could result from Fountain and Butler's quarreling. I am sure that England is in good hands with such experienced and dignified men leading it. 
You need to fret not, uh, Lord Portsmouth, for I have confidence in your ability to lead England. I recall our time in the Domville administration and, and your enthusiasm for agricultural matters. Whomever you select for your cabinet, knowing the company you keep, shall too perform their tasks with diligence and determination. However, if I may respectfully offer some advice, I would kindly ask you to take care with your direction at the Foreign Office. As a former and distinguished Foreign Secretary myself, I can attest to the importance of cultivating good relations with Germany. I spent many nights in the homes of important dignitaries, captains of industry, and garrison commanders building the relationships and favors necessary to maintain their favor. Never forget that we live in a new age, one dominated by the continent, and Britain's role is to be a tower of security, a sanctity, and respectability in Europe. I'm sure that you'll consider these words greatly in the years to come. Please do not hesitate to contact me if you would like an audience for your concerns. My door is always open to you. Respectfully yours. Ron and Alcane, second Baron Brockett. Its receivers smile face with each paragraph until there's only a slight frown. A purge long overdue. When the Germans came to our isles those 20 years ago, they set upon creating the government that would be friendly to their interests. In doing so, they saw fit to invite pragmatic members to join in the government. Fleeing from their old collapsing regime, this would prove to be their greatest mistake since then. The pragmatists have acted as rods in our government, crippling our attempts to bring Britain to its rightful place as a fascist power. Now we have opportunity to wipe, to wipe this slate clean and correct the mistakes made in 1944. These figures have no place in our new order, in our hollow party. The uprisings have shown all that sympathetic to democracy will inevitably scurry away at the first opportunity. Let then be chucked out like rats for that they are, for uh, for the British People's Party is a party of British fascists and no one else. God, this is not good for us. The old master's call. Within the halls of Westminster are little treasures reserved for the highest of the nation's servants. Social bars, tea rooms, well appointed and staffed for the comfort. Guess as these amenities uh, were rarely permitted and strictly controlled, John Bean supposed that, that was why he was drinking a pint in the House of Lords bar on its terrace overlooking the river. The man next to him invited him here to cut a deal. He drank out of decorum but had no appetite. John said, A.K. Chesterton, sitting his pint down, I want to ask you a favor. I already know, Arthur. The answer is no. Chesterton sighed. John, please. Lord Portsmouth has surrounded himself with the genteel. I want you in a corner, keeping him in touch with the common man. So I can be his court jester, so I can speak the truth to deaf ears? He shook his head. Anyone else might have earned a far more caustic tone, but Bean's respect for his mentor kept it at bay. You don't think much of Andrew, but I've never met a man who understood that what Britain needs is better than. Careful, you're in their house. The rusted on fools who surround your man. For the love of God, he look around you. Fountain's done. This morning alone, three MPs whose loyalties were once unshakable have supported us. Kingswood, Salford, Taunton, bloody Taunton, they're all with Gerard now. Look good for him. Bean set down his half-finished pint, but I'd rather fight for Britain than its lords, he rose. Gave Chesterton a pitying look. And thank you, Arthur, but the answer's no. Tell Walt my loyalties aren't as flexible as Kingswood's. Chesterton's frustrations were more mollified by the news of another defection. A memorandum. A memoriam. It's a simple sad truth that even the greatest of men may be terribly flawed and that the mistakes can cost them dearly. Like uh, Lord Dom like Lord, Domba allowed a lot like Fontaine and a weasel like Butler far too much influence. Like Chesterton, he remained far too complacent in the face of Judeo Bolshevik terror. Worst of all, he bowed and scraped without complaint when the Germans demanded the right to ravage our beautiful green land. For all those flaws, he was our friend, a valiant champion of the British character, a Titan struggling, standing in the face of treason. Uh, stabbed in the back by that vicious snake knight. His loyal service to Britannia must not be forgotten. As a final gesture of well-earned respect, we shall arrange a state, a state funeral to lay him to rest. And we'll read about uh, uh, from a bird's eye view, and then we'll do a moment of time. Because he has two routes. A legacy, or pushing forward. From a bird's eye view, the Earl of Portsmouth and Lord of Tavistock stood together amongst a handful of other lords, both their hands hanging over the railing of the top floor as they watched over the commons. They seemed to be busy having a debate of some description, although the topic did not matter to the two. Indeed, their eyes were drawn to something else far more interesting. The seats that had laid vacant for decades declared for their opposition had recently been filled by none other than former pragmatic, pragmatist faction of the party. Walp expelled them, and even with this large chunk of the party gone, the British People's Party still had a supermajority. Even with their attempt against the old guard, almost all their pragmatists knew that because of the nation's election laws, their seats may flip given time. The pair watching were very amused by the fact. You know, of Hastings, I've been hearing rumors about all those chaps down there. And let me tell you, there's never a rumor about something good. The two chuckled harder than they ever had in years. You see the one on the right side? I heard <clears throat> I heard his wife cheated on him for Bolshevik and the Himmler. Rab Butler was very involved in the debate on the Commons floor. He was practically the leader of the pragmatist opposition, defending several of the pragmatist members when they were attacked and adopted a fierce demeanor towards his former colleagues. Although more focused on the debate on the ground, he looked up occasionally, trying to detect what some of the noise was coming from above. He did not catch Walp in Bedford just yet. After, after one more su successful punchline from Wallop, he glared at both of them with a look that could kill. The two noticed Butler's stare and laughed even harder than any of the rumors circulating that the Prime Minister could twist. They both turned back at the moment, leaving to head back for a meeting at 10 Downing Street and a moment in time. Now that we've dealt with our immediate problems, the time has come to consider the path we are on. Looking back, the history of our governance under Domville and Chesterton has been far from lawless, and it's likely that their brand of fascism contributed to the two uprisings we have faced. 
Lord Wallop has grand ideas of his own to revitalize the English stock, ideas which would truly see a return to the greatness of days long lost, however. The old guard of the BPP, which depends on, uh, which he depends on for backing, would be largely appalled by his ideas and would be perhaps better to stick with their methods for stability's sake. Oh, one thing is clear, a choice must be made and soon. Final voyage. It was a rainy day, one fitting for the mood of the day. Wallop supposed Barry Dombo is not a man for pomp ceremony, yet he was a man that certainly deserved it, especially after being taken from Britain so cruelly. However, he would not have wished to be laid in state, but a state funeral was required nonetheless. It was packed with BPP members, all old friends and dedicated supporters of the old guard wanting to see their old leader off one last time. Gerard Wall was never a man who cried often, but the speeches his compatriots had given in honor of their old friend had left his face streaked with tears. The unfairness of the situation rang true when Bedford, Chesterton, and Nell Kane reminded him of how cruel it was that they were bereft of Donville. When the proceedings began to come to a close, he strode up to the podium, eyes lingering on the casket as he did so. It was closed. Given the nature of Donville's death, the Prime Minister cleared his throat and took a deep breath. Friends, party members, my fellows in arms, you all know that Barry Donville was a great man. He served his country dutifully and without complaint for years, taking the slings and arrows from those who would see your country reduced to rubble. He was all this and more, but above all else, Wallop choked up his breath hitching. Above all else, he was my friend, our friend, and he'll be so very missed. May we meet again one day in heaven, Barry. And with that, three well-armed policemen began to wheel the coffin off stage and through the sparse crowds that had gathered. He would be taken to a train which would bring him to his final resting place, a quiet little cemetery near his home. Rest easy, easy Admiral. A peculiar past. Pest. Wallop. We never meant it openly, but his first thoughts upon seeing the new chief mouse here skulking was whether they would kick up too much of a fuss if he stuffed the mangy rat catcher in a sack and threw her into the Thames. Perhaps that's not harsh, but Wallop, I never particularly liked urban cats, separated from a natural wilderness suitable for its development, raised among humans who cannot teach these cats what its true mothers might, these little creatures would wreak havoc on natural wildlife. Many smaller animals risk endangerment or extinction because of the urbanites of imprisonment insist on keeping these pests as pets. Well, I prefer the stalwart companionship of dogs to the arbitrary proclivities of a cat, but he admitted those hard sell for 10 Downing Street. The staff who he inherited were used to a feline presence, and the staff he brought with them had come to expect it. They all heard stories of the, the light Peter the Third uh, brought into the lab and demanded that Peter bring them the same. Considering the secretaries he had caught cooing over the creature in lieu of proper work, Peter had succeeded. Late one night, when the demands of his new uh, role forced Wallop to stay at 10 Downing Street, rather than his beloved Checkers, he kept his head down and his lights dimmed, writing as if under catalyte to replicate a more comfortable experience. His door was left slightly ajar as he was expecting Bedford to join him later that night, but the door creeped open with nobody there. Wallop looked up and looked like an unwelcome phantasm, leapt up from behind the desk of the chief mouse here. Peter meowed, stretching her limbs and laying down Wallop's paperwork. His mental defenses broke under this overwhelming assault. With a liver spot of hand, he reached out and scratched between Peter's ears. The cat closed its eyes, purred, and having found this act of fealty acceptable, left off the desk and back into the light of the hallway. Peter would be spared the sack and the river this day. Stuck in a mine place, or mine palace. Rain pounded on the centuries old brick roof covering the Prime Minister's office on 10 Downing Street. Wallop, kicking his feet up on the desk, explained to himself, I have to clean this office one of these days. That day had left him by himself. The day had left by himself, and with his only true con constant companions to accompany him, his thoughts. The most basic and predictable of the voices in his head floated the same idea he had been following, and indeed he had planned to follow, for the foreseeable future, to continue the agendas of his predecessors, and finally fulfill the party's decades-old dreams, including continuing the process of eventually in building the invaluable New English chart character. But another less familiar voice brought into play an idea that truly piqued his interest. He had the chance to bring about everything he had ever wanted, his chance to rebuild the dignified Agrarian state fueled by social credit, the system that he eat. Now the party had always dreamt of. It was right there. He only needed it to take it. If it, if it wasn't as if this idea had no support amongst the party leaders. Lord Tavistock had promised Wallop his eager support for the latter personally, as he was blocked from enacting such legislation in his own time as Prime Minister. Although just as before, Chesterton and a wider section of the party would be left again aghast once they heard of the plans. He went back to the first idea, considering that the old guard's legacy would be at risk and could crumble under such a radical change. If he stuck to the party's baseline, he would be able to keep Britain afloat for much longer under his leadership. But was that false sense of stability really worth it when Britain was stuck in the dirt and he had the same chance to change all of it? I must take the interests of the party and of the country more seriously than the interests of my own. The old bones become new and the new becomes old again. The old guard remains in power unfettered and unchanged. Or I will not let Britain continue to stagnate into the, hands, the bloody hands of narrow-minded bureaucrats. Mother Nature smiles as the established order breaks. Social credit has proven itself as a future for England and her stock. But we're going to end the episode there because, uh, after we read the English Revival. Because we gotta, we'll have two more episodes to each do the routes here. England by nature leads Britain. It's always been and always will be. And thus, it is of paramount importance that English culture and traditions remain unspoiled and sacred. Unfortunately, this is not the case. English culture has been under attack for centuries. And the attackers have gotten... Uh, uh, or the attacks have gotten worse in recent years due to the corrupt and degrading influence of the United States. Even now that Britain has been freed from them, the vile ideals promoted by the cabal us usurers 
that run the government continue to corrupt England's spirit. There's only one solution to this, a fight fire with fire. For every disgusting piece of propaganda pushed by the bankers of America, we must respond with 100 pieces promoting the exorcism of international finance and the exaltation of the English spirit. If you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I will see you tomorrow. As we'll see what else we can do with Gerard Wallop. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.